I am going to be your dividend messiah this evening. I will take you to the promised land if you will let me Sherpa you. I'm much a clown, folks. A financial clown on the YouTube sphere of trying to look at stocks and uh, get ahead into somewhat a financial independence to perhaps one day retire early. I don't know what I'm saying or how I'm saying it. So we'll see how this turns out tonight, folks, as I wanted to do a Friday night live stream, uh, kind of answering your questions. There were so many damn good questions and the excitement that starts to build up um, as people start to see hope, you know, light at the end of this godforsaken tunnel, which is actually really funny because if you are a Canadian focused investor buying the S&P 500, guess what? You would be at all time highs right now just because of the dollar conversion, which I don't even think most people are aware of at this point, which is kind of a neat way to arbitrage your way to a uh, all time high portfolio. But today I really want to focus on the dividend side of things. We're going to talk a bit about retirement because dividends really play a big role into a lot of the questions I've been getting about kind of withdrawal rates into the retirement side of it. Um, this is going to be a fun filled, uh, exciting Friday evening. So I appreciate you all stopping by. Feel free to throw some comments around as we kind of get into these and hit that like button. Uh, while you're down there, sharing those comments, folks. So we're going to kick it off with Numero Uno here because uh, this is a very personable question that I've been honestly rethinking since I purchased a piece of real estate. But it's kind of like me and my wife uh, got $160,000 invested in a portfolio, another hundred and twenty dollars into a pension fund. I'm 35. She's 33. Would you say we are saving enough for retirement? Let's just presume we take your average base of 35 and we'll kind of use that to run some math on the compound calculator. And this math is going to be purely dependent on what your cost of living is. Now, I was contemplating this big problem and kind of joking about it in the chat group for the patron members where we're kind of saying like, you know, a million dollars doesn't go as far as it used to. If you don't own uh, a property, especially where I live, the cost of rent now is around $40,000 a year, which is just bonkers because if your withdrawal rate is 4% and you have a million dollars, well, guess what? That million dollars is only going to make you enough to base cover your rent, presuming that rent doesn't keep going up, which it seems to be, and it's just nutty. But let's presume you've kind of got your cost of living under control. And you know, and I don't even want to talk about the pension side of it. That extra 120000 you probably don't even have to put another dollar toward your retirement and you'll make it there. So let's even just show you from the 160000 uh, perspective. With 160000 bucks. A substantial amount of money at 35. And let's say we don't even add another dime to it and you're going to be retiring at 60. Most people push it to 65, but let's just say 65 and you're getting the average market return somewhere after inflation of around 8%. That will leave you with over a million dollars, let alone the other 120,000 you have saved. So realistically, you could probably stop putting money away if you don't really want to invest and your goal is to just live and be comfortable. Like you've socked a decent amount of money away though. Obviously I always recommend continuing to put away that extra at least $500 a month or that 6,000 annually because my God, over 25 years, that takes you to over a million and a half and probably well beyond that. Cause I mean, let's be real again with that pension of 220, that takes you up to what, 280 roughly invested or uh, 60, yeah, 280 ish. That'll give you about two and a half mil. Like you're fine. You're, you're well on your way. There's nothing to worry about, which kind of leads into this next question here. What's your drawdown strategy in your RSP since SCHD is in US dollars? Thanks. Awesome content. So this is a good question for anybody. I honestly, the drawdown rate doesn't really matter as much to me with SCHD, my RSP, because as mentioned, I'll probably start withdrawing capital long before the age of retirement out of my registered retirement savings plan, which I'll be taxed. So I'm not going to do it until I'm in like a lower tax bracket or it makes a little bit more sense or I lose my job or something like that happens and I need the money. But right now I am God by no means anywhere near close to uh, an early retirement from a stock portfolio standpoint. Um, we're in a good position between me and my wife, but we definitely got a, a ways to go before we're going to be uh, where we want to be. But my goal primarily is to keep these indexes the primary source and do a withdrawal rate of about 3%. The average goal is to get the portfolio between three and four. I'm happy with it being around three. At about a million dollars, that'll give me about $30,000 that I can withdraw. Um, well, the portfolio is barely being touched at that point because I do want to continue the growth, especially if I'm going into an early retirement. So by 40, you know, if I could build up between me and the wife about a million dollar portfolio, you're drawing about three to 4%. After we have a paid off mortgage, you know, I'm hoping inflation doesn't continue to be nuts, but hopefully by that point, most of our base expenses should be able to be covered in perpetuity just off that 30 or 40 grand because we live very frugal, cheap lives. If you can't live like, 
you know, with getting the rent thing out of the way and just owning a property, like how crazy fast your expenses drop, especially when you start paying that mortgage down quick and you own a piece of paid for real estate. I mean, it, you can start seeing how retirement just becomes a little bit more, you know, reasonable, especially with a lot lower numbers. Um, so, you know, 3% would be the goal for the early retirement. And then obviously as you get to 60 and 65, you, you're going to get pensions. There's so many bonuses that come later in life if you can achieve this much earlier. Um, but those are kind of the goals. I don't really care if it's US dollars or Canadian. Obviously, I'm mostly US invested. I'll just convert the currency. It doesn't bother me to convert it or pay a fee to do so, um, which leads into some more intriguing questions. This one's a little bit more in depth. So bear with me here just for a second. Blup, 9552. Very interesting. I got to love this guy's, uh, look at this guy's uh, image here and <laughs> his title. I'm curious how you come up with this. It's kind of funny. Uh, but he says, hey, Kyle, uh, let me make sure you guys are reading this as well. I got it up on the screen there. Yeah, he says, hey, Kyle, I was curious if in a live stream or upcoming video, you could discuss the infamous debate on dividends versus growth. Is there truly a reason to care about higher dividend yield or a dividend snowball effect? Don't dividends just cause the share price to go down? I understand the stability and value of companies that typically pay a dividend in SCHD or VAYM, but the only value I see in a dividend is receiving um, basically some of your money now in case you need it at the cost of your total return in the future. I'd also be interested in seeing how SCHD with the reinvested dividends could perform uh, versus the VOO with a lower yield reinvested over 20, 30 year period. Uh, would a multiple year flat market benefit an SCHD on a drip and possibly outperform a VOO versus a, or I'm sure you mean SCHD versus a VOO uh, during a multiple year bull run? Would that make uh, holding both a hedge against one another? Maybe I'm thinking way too deep about this, but thanks. And I think you're not thinking too deep. I think you're just bringing up this rooted conversation that has constantly been debated since I've been investing. And I'm always a guy that has advocated that typically total return matters more than dividend income. And I'm only saying this because too many people earlier on, and I kind of got a victim to this of being a dividend bug. But at the same time, I think balancing your portfolio of having income and growth is more prudent than just focusing on growth because I think we have a long runway ahead of us for growth. Even though val like growth stocks are saying they're overvalued, they're this or that, I still think we're in this kind of this multi, you know, 20, 30 year, 20, 50, 100 year period of just technological boom that's going to offer more value and margin to the market than we've seen in a very long time. And I want to be a part of that, obviously, but at some point there's still fear and some things you have to understand about growth stocks that I think you kind of have to go back through history to understand. And that is like during the dot com bubble which I don't think we're in by any metric, but you don't know. You have no idea if a black swan event happens to the economy, if something happens to the debt, a war, who the heck knows, right? But the fact is, is there's been periods in history, especially from the dot-com bubble, where you would have had to go about 15 years before you started seeing a rate of return if you weren't cost averaging and you just bought the tops. Uh, even if you were cost averaging for that matter, because 2008 hit, it really devastated the market for quite some time. Even if you bought the bottoms of uh, uh, what 2002 you still had to wait what i mean almost a good seven or eight years before you started seeing any substantial return and during that time period dividends would have outperformed the market because companies get earnings and though people are like oh my god it comes out of the share price yes but it gets recouped because the company keeps generating money from that business it's just kind of swapping some of it to you and realistically the company a good company typically retains some of those dividends so it's not like they're paying out all their cash flow which should go into reinvesting and building the company or doing whatever, which continues to add value over the long run, right? So this is why I think you, you need to find that balance. I've always been a dividend and a growth investor. I've been a combination of both. I always kind of lean one to the other, depending on what the market's doing. But these days I'm finding myself right in the middle. And I really believe that SCHD is a good balancer, whether it outperforms VOO or not. I just like having a combination of where the market's down, you have reinvestable dividends. It's nice having consistent cash flow to reinvest. And then again, you can always you know leverage into growth on a personal level with higher risk investments like the Qs, you know, the Russell 2000s, you can buy things like Tesla, just do it at a mitigated level. So you're not like putting too much risk on growth. Because again, you go into periods where growth gets wrecked. And if you were a big crypto investor, like a lot of people out there, like Andre Sheik, a lot of big YouTubers put massive amounts of their portfolio in highly speculative assets. And they better be holding on for dear life and pray to God crypto comes back to the level that it did. And you know, a lot of those people put crypto in assets and, you know, trading accounts, they couldn't even get it back out of. They went bankrupt. They lost it. FTX, all these companies, right? There's a lot of risk if you put it all in one basket. So the diversity method, I think, works the best. It's not one is better than the other. People that hate dividends that are like total return is all that matters. 
in my heart, I believe that, but in the reality of the markets, depending on what market you're in, one is always better than the other. So it's better to just balance both. And another good example too, you look at growth companies like Alibaba, for example, that are now paying a dividend. And a lot of growth investors are like, why would Alibaba pay a dividend? Oh my God, the stock is so cheap. Why aren't they doubling down on their, their share buybacks, which they're doing both now. But the problem with Alibaba and growth stocks, especially like this, is sometimes stocks will only grow if there's money that people are willing to put into it. It's really a shame that a company can grow and the stock can do nothing. And that's what the big fallacy to me is and why the market are is truly fugazi to some extent, is a lot of people that are against dividends that are really about growth and the long-term value of a stock and they only look at balance sheets are kind of idiots because the perspective in, of the market on a stock matters almost more than the balance sheet. And because nobody likes Alibaba, just like nobody's going to invest in the tobacco sector, you, I mean, what's the institutional ownership? I'm curious on Alibaba right now. So Alibaba right now is trying to play a game where they're trying to coddle the global markets and bring back, you know, those investment dollars because it's just that there's such a tarnish on the Chinese market that nobody wants to buy. It doesn't matter how good your growth story is. If no one's going to buy the stock, you're kind of up shit's creek, right? Like, I mean, let's take a look. Can we see? Uh, yeah, I mean, institutional ownership in Alibaba is 15%. You know how bad that is? Like, it's crazy. Look at a company like, I mean, uh, Altria Group. Altria Group should be another good example. Like the tobacco sector, I think, is one of the most cheapest sectors of the entire market. There's good value there. There's still growth going on. Uh, not with MO. I don't like MO as much as I like British American. But look at the insider. Actually, this one's actually really held by institutions. Kind of blown away. Somehow there's 60% ownership. I don't believe that. Let's look at something like British American Tobacco. I have a hard time believing there's 60% unless they're like really, well, maybe actually, I think SCHD actually holds it. So maybe there's some more institutional ownership than I'm thinking. But when you look at something like British American, yeah, there's only like 7.9%. Nobody's holding British American tobacco. I still don't believe MO's numbers. I have a hard time believing 60% of the stock is owned by institutions. But that's the problem, right? institutions, if they don't like your stock, if big money's not willing to buy you, they're never going to buy you. You're seeing this now with China across the board. China is trying to like ease global tensions. You know, Biden hails real progress after four hours of talking with Xi, Xi, Jinping, Xi Jinping. I can't even say his name right now. Um, but yeah, China, China wants to play. Like they want to be on the global level. They understand they screwed themselves royally in 2020 and they need to come back. We're even seeing Elon Musk. I mean, you know, <laughs> you know, everybody's doing the China thing right now. So this could be a good thing for Alibaba investors. But the fact of the matter is, is, you know, when it comes to growth stocks, you, when you look at companies like Tesla and you wonder how they trade at the values they do, it's because people believe in them. Institutions believe in them. There's a lot of hope in the future. There's not a lot of hope in some companies' futures. Tobacco, Chinese stocks, even though they're great companies, if you can't change the perspective, the stock price doesn't seem to reflect much change either. So taking a look here, uh, someone's saying they got $100,000 of RBC a week ago. Congratulations. Um, I, I like gloating that the dividend stocks are doing well. I kind of over dramatize what the market's doing for fun. Um, we're making a lot of money, obviously, probably more money than I've seen in the last two years. Uh, and I've been gloating the dividend, uh, the bank stocks specifically. I think there's more value in banks today than there has been in probably a good 15 or 20 years. And I can only state that because the dividends are higher than they've been in over you know, 15 years for a lot of these banks. And uh, they're bouncing back a lot. I mean, we're seeing 10% bumps in these companies over the last uh, two weeks, right? I mean, you know, Royal Bank's up 11%. Obviously, no one's catching the bottoms here. Anyone that caught the bottoms, I'd be blown away by. Most of us are just cost averaging from the highs. Uh, I didn't. I wasn't even able to get VDY back at like the very bottoms, but no one's catching that. Like no one's getting that full rate. But there's still good value here, and I don't know if it's going to pull back at some point. Earnings are coming out at the end of this month. Uh, actually, I think we might start getting some next week if we're lucky. Um, so something to pay attention to. I'm very excited because if those earnings come in as stable as say like J.P. Morgan and Bank of America's did, we could be in a good place, right? Look at Bank of uh, Nova Scotia here. This one bumped up nicely. Uh, it jumped up a good 10%, still about a 7% dividend yield on it, which is just absolutely astounding. Uh, certainly no complaints if you've been buying these banks. Honestly, I think this is still a good, not financial advice, but I still think it's a generational buying opportunity um, if, if you believe in, in this kind of, again, this, this is the kind of opportunity where um, growth, you can get real growth now from high yielding dividend stocks, which I think is astounding. Uh, when you look at some of the future projections on like REITs and some of these bank stocks, presuming even if their revenue and growth doesn't change into the future, like your expected rate of return is going to be somewhere between, 
I, even with a company like Bank of Nova Scotia, I'd probably put somewhere between 20 to 30% a year, probably for two or three years at least, maybe even more than that, just because of how discounted they are at their current price to earnings multiple, because these banks usually trade uh, usually a bit higher than where they're currently trading, even at a PE standpoint. Um, so you can expect a much higher rate of return over the coming years, presuming the economy stabilizes and everyone kind of goes back to a soft landing perspective, I guess. But does your portfolio hold any international dividend payers and ETFs? It mainly looks like Canadian stocks. If I was a smarter man, I'd probably hold like the Ray Dalio international ETFs, but I don't like them. I don't like global markets. I don't understand half the stuff going on everywhere. It's like, you know, a lot of people think you need it for to, to be at like, you know, a, a really safe, stable portfolio, like these, these total market index funds, but you can go that route for sure if it's your comfortability. But for me, it's like, you know, I'm running my business primarily in Canada and the US. And, you know, most of the stocks I own, they operate at a global level. And I just don't see why I need to own inferior companies. And that doesn't mean they're going to be inferior forever. Obviously, China's trading at discounted levels. Uh, Africa's coming up a lot. There's a lot of value on a global level. It's just to me, I just understand U.S. companies better. It's where my comfort level is. And honestly, I really don't think you need to own like the whole entire global market to have a really good investment portfolio. I think it's just a little over dramatized. So I just like having the U.S. and Canadian markets, um, you know, and just doing it that way. But uh, strike on REITs. Yeah, if you are a gambling man, I do not like the REIT ETFs. However, that's the one of the trickier situations. I guess you could buy them here and, and you probably do all right. But honestly, I think the real value is REITs almost operate as ETFs. The big risk with REITs is management. Uh, you got to make sure you get good management. But when you look at things like O Realty Income here, and I would focus more on the US REITs rather than the Canadian REITs. That's kind of where I've been falling lately. Canadian REITs are still trading at some value, but the real value is in these US REITs because their growth rates have been much higher. There's much more diversity. The market caps are like triple the size and they've dumped off by like 50%. I mean, look at something like realty income that's down 33%. And this thing jumped up pretty dramatically over the last, uh, you know, since the October bottom there, it's up 14%. Um, I think if you're looking for real growth and value and you want income, you could easily dig through the REIT market and find a lot of things like American Towers and Crown Castle. These, um, if you don't know these REITs, they're of the biggest in the US and they are primarily property holders of uh, basically telecom towers. They just rent land to telecom towers. I'm sure you've seen a lot of condo buildings in even Toronto or around you, anywhere really where you're gonna see like a lot of, of the uh, cell towers on top. And those are mostly rentals. Like when you see a condo building with uh, telecom towers on it, they're getting like that condo building is getting paid. Uh, for that. So this is like a pure play to that. And obviously this company's not going anywhere anytime soon. And it jumped huge. I mean, it's up 23% off the, the October lows. And this thing, I, I again, I'm not saying that these ones are trading at discounted values because they're trading still at very favorable values. But I think if you buy them here, you're getting a very high quality REIT at a very fair value for today's price because they they always trade over value. I mean, these companies trade at premiums. They're like Apple, like you never get a discount on them. And for some reason, everyone's just kind of like, oh, interest rates, end of the world for REITs. Let's like over dramatize this. And the, the stock loses like $80 billion in value all of a sudden, even though like the fundamentals haven't really changed outside of net income because of interest payments, probably some depreciation costs. You want to look into it a little deeper, but still to have a 20, you know, 30% decline in net income, which again, you got to keep in mind depreciation costs, but 30% doesn't really reflect, you know, the full frigging crash that happened here. And it's probably a little over dramatized at this point. Uh, we're taking a look at Northland Power, one of the first stocks I ever bought in my life. Ooh, the two first companies I ever bought that should be a resemblance of growth and dividends was Northland Power, a monthly paying Canadian renewable utility that's globalized and Canopy Growth Corp, the MJ markets, baby. Those These two stocks took me to the promised land. These two stocks changed my entire perspective and in investing outlook. It's crazy that I, uh, these were the first two companies I bought. Now I don't own either of them. I'm very thankful I don't own either of them. But today is Canopy, is Northland Power buying opportunity. I would avoid the MJ markets like the plague still. I don't, I don't, I don't like the MJ market. It's too competitive. But when it comes to Northland Power, um, I actually sold this one um, somewhere, I think, around here. Actually, no, it was earlier than that because I sold all my individual stocks somewhere at the beginning of 2022. So it was probably the first quarter, I think toward the end of the first quarter. I know I got out somewhere in this dip, probably this little line here. And this thing has plummeted 41%. Uh, so I definitely got out at a reasonable price. But is it a buying opportunity now with a 5.3% dividend yield, a 14 price to earnings, and it's trading pretty much at... 
you know, lows we haven't seen in almost 10 years at this point. And I've looked at this company a lot and I've kind of put it in my too hard basket because from the metrics I'm looking at, it is cheap. Um, it is trading at a good value. The problem is, is, you know, typically the market over anticipates and, you know, really projects the future of losses into a company. And this is what happened with tech companies in 2022 is their earnings started to go down and revenue started to go down. And then what happens is the stock will over project and people will freak out thinking this is going to continue for typically way longer than it actually does. And that's what's kind of happening here with Northland Power. I mean, their revenues are incredible. They've gone from 1.8 billion to 1.6 billion. On a year over year from 555 million to 513 million. Their sales are in a very reasonable position here. All things considered, what's the market cap? I mean, the market cap on this thing right now is $5 billion. So it's kind of incredible that a company that's worth 5 billion, you know, their total revenue for a year is probably going to be closer to 2 billion. So they're trading at like two, two and a half times sales. Absolutely insane. You know, you can't pick a tech company that trades anywhere damn near close to that against sales. That's just bonkers. And then you take a look at gross profit is 1.4 billion. I mean, gross profit's in a great place here. Net income is about 521 million. It's down from 780 million. The more I look into this, the only thing I don't like is that they have a drip system where if you reinvest the dividends, you get issued new shares, not you know marketable shares. Like you get brand new shares on the drip that come in at a discount. I don't know if that dividend plan is still set up. So the problem is, is like their diluted shares continue to grow pretty dramatically. From 232, whatever that probably is in the millions or billions of shares to 200 or 232 to 252, you're getting a lot of dilution right now, which also really hinders the company. But they can afford the dividend. I mean, it looks like, um, you know, cash provided from operating activities, 148 million. The dividends declared uh, were what? Cash, 52 million. Uh, total dividend, 76 million. Don't look at free cash flow. Free cash flow is not a good indicator with depreciation cost. You kind of want to look at the, the operating activity income. Like, I mean, they can afford the dividend. Everything about it screams pretty good discount here. You know, I'm not saying it's the worst buying opportunity ever. It's just the fact that the renewable sector is getting absolutely devastated as a lot of funds are liquidating a lot of their ESG companies. Uh, I think even the pension fund liquidated Northland Power and the pension fund had a lot of money in this company. Actually, what is the institutional ownership in this today? I'm kind of curious. I feel like everyone's given up on it, which isn't necessarily just. But I mean, the pain is semi-deserved. I think it's just getting over-exaggerated today. Let's take a look here real quick. Yeah, institutional ownership, eh, it's still pretty high at 42%. It's actually kind of impressive. Um, you know, insiders barely own any of this company anymore. But yeah, I'm surprised that the institutional ownership is still high. But we'll have to see what happens with it. I'm going to say it's a buying opportunity, but I'm not telling you to buy it. I'm not touching it. I think there's still some risk with it. But it definitely looks hella cheap. Hella, hella cheap right now. Uh, back to my Meet Kevin videos, making fun of Meet Kevin, deleting his channel this week. Uh, Meet Kevin had Enphase and Tesla in there. And Enphase is a good example of another one of these companies that were just getting absolutely wrecked. Um, I think Enphase is the second largest holding in Meet Kevin's pricing power ETF. And this thing, I mean, it's it's getting back to a favorable level as well. Honestly, I think there's really good value in the... Um, in the uh, obviously the, the you know the energy sector when it comes to these renewable plays, it's just a matter of how you want to do it and if you have the guts to play some of these stocks. Because like I said, I, I'm not as into these individual plays as aggressively as I used to be because I can look at ten companies right now that I would I would throw money at relentlessly. Things like Telus. I mean, there's so many companies out there that I would just love to buy, but I've realized that I just don't want to be managing 20 or 30 stocks again. And these ETFs that I'm buying upper weight, the best ones, and I get to position in all of them just by putting money in one thing. And I'm trying to concentrate my mine and my fiance's portfolios to a much more manageable level. Cause again, she holds a lot of individual tech companies. We don't need to own the queues. We basically made our own QQQ ETF and I do want to buy Tesla, but Tesla is the only one that makes sense to buy for me because we already own everything else, either concentrated in these ETFs, like the Canadian banks, some of the telecom giants, or, you know, we own them on an individual level. So, you know, I gotta be a little careful. And, you know, when it comes to these companies, like the pricing power ETF, I do want to point out that I'm very confident that there is a high likelihood that this ETF is going to underperform the S&P 500. Just because it kind of reminds me of like the Kathy Wood ETF where Tesla is probably the only company you really need to hold 
but because it holds all these other companies that are much more volatile and Tesla's volatile, Tesla's overvalued. There's a lot of risk with these companies and the fees. I think meet Kevin's fees are like 0.7%. Like the money you're losing to fees to have such a concentrated portfolio with 25% just sitting in Tesla and end phase or like Tesla's 25 end phase is 11, like, you know, 36, 37% of this entire portfolio is in two stocks. And then you just have the chip sector and a lot of other volatile things that, like I said, I just think it's too, too all over the place with, a lot of things I would not want to own. So I'm, I'm, I'm not a fan of me, Kevin, though, in that aspect. If I honestly meet Kevin, what he should have done is he should have found a way to make himself investable through his YouTube channel. I think two things me, Kevin did well was real estate personally and in YouTube and social media. I don't think he's done politics. Well, I don't think he's done business in stock market investing. Well, I mean, his, his, I wish he could show his performance because I highly doubt his performance outside of Tesla has been that great. Every stock he picked went to basically bankrupt, just like me, financial education. We've all been there. I mean, I've talked about stock. I own stocks too that pretty much went bankrupt as well, but I, I mitigated them super early um, just because I saw the risk and it scared the crap out of me, right? So I'm not perfect by any metric. I can't really beat down to them when I'm no better to some metrics, right? Um, but Kevin and Jeremy, two of the biggest clowns on YouTube. Yeah, we're all a bunch of clowns, right? I just think it's funny how the YouTube sphere has shifted so much now that people have realized, because YouTube was so new 10 years ago and like it was only been in the last five to eight years we've been seeing finance influencers, but now people have recognized that we don't actually know what we're doing. No more than Wall Street does. That's what makes it so intriguing. And when you watch somebody like Jeremy, like literally pick the worst portfolio of stocks, and it just shows you like in certain times, just because a balance sheet looks good, doesn't mean it's going to be good in the future. I mean, we were just talking about it today. Like one of the prime examples, a company that sponsored my channel was the Very Good Butchers. Um, and that company looked like it was on top of the frigging world. That company man in the uh, in the you know the the health you know the the meat you, the, your your lentil meats and stuff like that like they were crushing it. I mean I don't know what it was with that movement, but clearly it was just a fad and it didn't last, right? I mean Beyond Meat, all those companies basically like they went bankrupt. It's kind of wild because if you looked at their balance sheet and the growth, you'd have been like, this is a great company. But it just shows you how complicated and convoluted business and investing really is. And unfortunately, um, you have to be a trader sometimes or a swing trader. Like when you're buying individual stocks, you have to pay attention to them. You just do. Look at Warren Buffett. I'm going to do a video on Warren Buffett um, tomorrow. And he sold every, like he sold Procter and Gamble. He sold Johnson and Johnson. He sold General Motors. Like he has been selling and trading stocks since the pandemic. Like you wouldn't believe. Like you have to be actively trading individual companies. Unless you just buy an S&P 500 ETF that weights them based on market cap, you have to be careful, right? Yeah, I'll answer some of these in a quick sec. I'm just going to finish up with a few more because I know some of you have been asking me about these things I've looked at. Um, I've lost 200K since Biden in my portfolio. I've been hearing a lot of people blame politics for all this stuff. And as much as it's fun to blame politics, it's... It's just, it's a lot harder than that, unfortunately. I mean, really, you can't blame Biden for your portfolio going down because Trump was actually in office during the pandemic and Trump came in when all the policies that caused inflation came in, when the Fed and every, you know, basic politician was saying it was all, you know, transitory and it wasn't. So, I mean, blame who you want. But yeah, I... You know, I love watching, you know, the um, if you watch the House of Commons here in Canada and just how destructive it is right now, it's like a, a high school drama set. It's so dramatic between Polyev and Trudeau right now. Um, it's kind of crazy, but I, you can't. It's so hard to blame politics for what's going on. I, I, I'm like, I'm not the biggest, biggest fan of, you know, Dave Ramsey, but he makes a good point that like if you're relying on your financial future and, you know, relying on politics for that, like you're not going to have a great financial future. Trudeau is the woke agenda, <laughs> idiot. Yeah, I mean, you know, make fun of him all you want. I got nothing against it. However, I, if I can bet on the next election cycle, I am going to. I honestly believe without a doubt that uh, just based on like popular opinion, based on what I'm seeing that, uh, you know, Paul Diab is going to win. And that's not my like, you know, I don't care about either of them. I, I am so atypical against against pol political views. But I just just like investing, if you just listen enough and you pay attention enough to news and you watch like social media, like that guy is just taking over by storm. So I'll probably try and gamble on it. I, I'd be comfortable doing that. Uh, why do you invest in VOO in your TFSA and not uh, VFA, uh, VFE? Um, this is just personal stance. And I was just talking about this at the beginning of the stream, right? 
that if you bought VFE, you're actually sitting at an all-time high because of the dollar conversion. So congratulations. This is why it's great as a Canadian to invest in the U.S. markets because um, you do get some benefit with that dollar converting when the U.S. dollar is a bit stronger here. But I just like owning the U.S. dollar. I, I just... I'm sorry, it is the global currency powerhouse and continues to be. And at the end of the day, because I'm not drawing money against my portfolio and I'm not converting that currency, US dollar is more spendable than Canadian currency is. So if I'm traveling somewhere and I want to use US dollars, I can. I can, without converting it, pull it out of my investment account, go to the bank, get US cash or get a US debit card and i can go travel the world and spend us dollars anywhere because they're accepted globally easier than i can spend canadian dollars which blows my mind i mean go to somewhere any go go to go anywhere in the world with canadian dollars and us dollars and slap down a canadian 10 dollar bill and try and buy something they won't even know what it is <laughs> like they're not going to accept that garbage unless you're going to convert it for them but us dollars oh baby the us dollar you know it don't matter what country you walking in Baby, they're going to accept that thing like like you wouldn't believe. I mean, I would just rather own U.S. currency. And I'm really grateful that we live in a country where we have that capability. Like you should be grateful that you can just open up an investment account for tax free, make U.S. money off U.S. corporations. You know, literally, it's it's almost mind blowing that our we in the Western world, we're so lucky to have that capability. I mean, <laughs> I'm kind of getting so excited. I just gave myself hiccups. Jesus, Jesus Christ. Oh, man. All right, let me have a drink here. Cheers to a, a good Friday of investing and growth, folks. Let me read some of your comments quick um, when it comes to these, because I think you're talking about the bank ETF, right? Uh, right? Uh, because I know you were talking that there's a new bank ETF, and I think this is the one, which is HBNK, which is the uh, Horizons Equal Weight Bank ETF. And this is a good recommendation, actually. I was looking into this. And uh, this is very cool and interesting. It's kind of a new ETF, but basically right now Horizon launched this and they're not charging any fees. And their fee, I think, is going to be like what? I think you made a comment saying it was like 0 0.09. Yeah, look at this. So the other bank ETF, the fee is way too high. And it's been one of my biggest complaints, which I'm going to, I think it's ZEB or something like that is the ticker of the BMO equal weight bank ETF. So right now there is no fee on this until July of 2024. Actually, I might even buy this. Um, this is like such a good recommendation. So the, the, the fee is 0.09% when it does come into play, not until July of next year. And the, the, the dividend on the banks right now combined is five, you're going to get 5.4%, no management fee, and you're going to get an equal weighting to the banks. Honestly, in a time where banks are, I think, the best buying opportunity like of a 15 year, 20 year period, I don't think you could have picked a better ETF. I think this is very intriguing. And uh, what's the volume, though? That could be one of the big downfalls here. Every time I see a new ETF, the biggest thing I'm worried about is the fact that the volume is excessively low. Um, what's the? I'm curious what the average volume is. Can I look this up on Yahoo or is it going to show me on here? Is it going to show me the average volume? It says the volume 7,600 shares. That's not too bad, but what's the average? Because the problem with these ETFs is you buy them and you can't even close the position on it. HBNK, let's see if it's on Yahoo. Because Yahoo usually shows me here. Let's take a look. It's the biggest fear, man. You go to buy it and it won't let you buy it. Yeah, okay. Average volume is about 17,000 shares. It's actually not too bad. That's pretty good. I mean, it's not crazy, but it's not terrible. 17,000 times 19 is what? Um, that's going to give you a total trading of about 323,000. I mean, if you're buying a huge position in it, it's likely you're going to close it over multiple days. But that's that's not bad. Uh, that's really not bad. Uh, what are your thoughts on Dave Ramsey's latest videos talking about 8% withdrawal rate in retirement? Yeah, he's been getting criticized. I don't think I've ever seen Dave Ramsey under so much drama because the 8% withdrawal rate is presuming the market continually goes up. He was actually reaming out his own employee, like the guy that comes on his show and, and fills in some of his, his show, right? I don't even know if I can look that up right now. That is kind of actually, uh, it's funny how dramatic that is for people. Um, let's take a quick look here. Uh, Dave Ramsey. Uh, yeah, everybody's blowing up about this 8% thing. Uh, I bet it comes up pretty much right away. Yeah, look at Dave Ramsey, 8% rule will make you poor. And yeah, I, I think he, uh, I think it's funny because Dave Ramsey's so in his ways that when he makes these opinions, he's like super stern about it. And it, it, it's funny how it comes off when it's wrong uh, because it is wrong. I mean, realistically, you can't draw 8% because the market goes down. Uh, you know, statistically, the market will go down 10 or 15 or 20 percent, 30 percent some years. And sometimes it might take two years to recover. And you do not want to be drawing 8 percent. And this is, comes back to the conversation of dividends, right? I want to get about three or four percent in dividends while holding index funds and never, ever touch the initial investment. Whereas if you just hold growth companies or the S&P 500, like Dave Ramsey says, growth, growth and income, like you have to draw against that growth. 
And this is what I've been like advising my mother into retirement. Like my mom, we're like, she's building out her retirement portfolio in arguably the best market environment you could possibly be retiring if you have capital to invest. And we've, and, and she only wants to buy dividend stocks. And I told her like, there's going to be a time where the market grows and it's going to grow aggressively. And these dividend stocks are going to underperform that growth. So why not buy some S&P 500? Yeah, you're only going to get a percent and a half, but just be patient with it. Because if the market grows one year where it goes up 10 or 20% and you want to go on a nice vacation or do something, draw against it. But I think in retirement, dividends are more important than growth because I, you also have to imagine that like you're not always going to be in the most stable mindset. And you, if someone's not managing your portfolio and you're brain unfortunately starts to deteriorate and you're playing with that portfolio i mean you could do some detrimental stuff ideally like i told my mother is like you want to get everything set up so you never have to touch it ever again you want to be so damn passive and so damn diversified and safe that you just pull that money out every month it gets deposited and forget about it so yeah the eight percent withdrawal rate is kind of nuts i think it's it's kind of crazy um uranium has been crushing Uranium, I'm going to make a bet right now that uranium uh, is going to be one of the best performing asset classes probably of the next five to 10 years and will likely even outpace the renewable sector. Um, because unfortunately, and a lot of people like Elon Musk are like, oh, well, you could realistically build only X amount of solar panels. It wouldn't take up that much land and it could power the vast majority of the US. But the problem is you can't just put solar panels in one place and get that electricity evenly distributed it's very expensive it's that i don't know i honestly just think uranium is the ultimate you know renewable resource because a lot of people got feared out of it after fukushima hit fukushima really scared the crap out of people because it was one bad event but how many people died during fukushima i mean realistically how many people die from oil every year in comparison like uranium is probably the safest thing actually i bet you more people die from renewable assets in constructing and building that than they do from nuclear energy uh fukushima uh, death toll how many people died um let me take a look here the fukushima on december 11th the strongest earthquake recorded for six minutes the earthquake caused a tsunami of you know yeah okay i know the, the tsunami killed a lot of people how many people died from fukushima I know it was like nothing. I think like a few people. It was so incremental in comparison to like how many people die from everything else. I, nuclear power is the greatest discovery humans have ever made. Uh, we just we just have to harness it correctly. And we are. I mean, you look at micro reactors. They're like genius systems that can never like melt down. Like we have fail safes and new reactors that are so damn safe that like it's going to change the world and it's going to be very unique you can put one reactor and it'll power everything for like 60 to 100 plus years without having to change it it's just nuts you'll never make a motor like that submarines they have nuclear submarines that can operate for literally like one or 200 years <laughs> without ever having to surface except for people to eat and get food it just shows you the resiliency of nuclear power right it's kind of crazy um i wouldn't touch bns oh why not man why wouldn't you touch the banks um, I, I kind of blows my mind. I honestly think the, um, uh, I could be wrong. Don't get me like, I'm just betting here, but I, you know, I just can't help. But when I look at the value of these companies and I look at the, the income and how like people just think the economy, look, this is the funny thing about stocks and people's perspectives. I can only look at the data I have today and use that to kind of understand what I'm investing. I cannot project into what's going to happen tomorrow. I am not a, a fortune teller. And when I look at the earnings, they're not that bad. They're just putting loan loss provisions aside. The revenues, most of the bank revenues are hitting all-time highs. That will eventually reflect unless the economy collapses. Why do you choose VDY over XCI? Because VDY has outperformed XCI over the long term. It's very simple. Uh, VDY actually outperformed the broader Canadian indexes, though I don't think that's going to continue moving forward. Um, it is a possibility. XCI, for those of you that don't know, is the Canadian Equal Weight Dividend ETF, whereas VDY is a much more concentrated ETF. It, it, I think VDY is like mostly Canadian banks and mostly the financial sector. But I honestly just like VDY. I think it's just a superior ETF because of how it weights companies. Equal weight ETFs are something you want in retirement. If you want growth, you can't get an equal weight ETF that grows. It's very hard to get an equal. Any Show me one equal weight ETF that has ever come close to a benchmark. They, they never touch benchmark. They never get close. Um, so you kind of kind of equal weight or weight the better companies to the top and Royal Bank and TD sit at the top of VDY dividends over total returns for me because I'm buying myself time. Yeah. And that's the thing, too. Right. Like you have to ask yourself the question is like, how stable is my job? If my job is not stable and at some point I could lose my job, I might need to rely on dividends more. 
And that's another thing that like you could look to build into the long term and use dividends and get the snowball effect going. So if something bad happens, at least, you know, you have some kind of backup income. Uh, you want oil exposure big time. I have uh, BDY gives you good oil exposure. Actually, I'm going to finish up with one more stock. Um, I'm an idiot, kind of mind blown. I have been making fun of um, of Canadian natural resources. OK, um, and I could never figure out why this stock has exploded as much as it has. I have been so ignorant to this that it, I'm honestly hating myself that I missed this. Um, it, and honestly, it kills me inside because as as somebody that watches the media so relentlessly, it, it, it makes me feel like an absolute moron. Look at this stock, okay? This company didn't do anything. This is like one of these you know oil companies, natural gas companies in Canada. This company has probably the largest natural gas reserve in all of Canada, probably one of the largest ones globally, right? Yet the stock hasn't done anything for damn near 20 years. Out of nowhere, the pandemic hits, and then for some reason, the stock blows up 651%. And it is still going up on earnings that are deteriorating. Every quarter, oil goes down. You know, earnings are getting crappier and crappier. Why does it hold? Why does it keep going up? Why? Tell me why. I could never figure it out. But then guess what? I realized that Canada is freaking investing 30 damn billion dollars into a natural gas freaking plant um, you know, where is it here? I, I got to find this stupid thing. One sec. Canada is investing $30 billion, um, you know, energy powerhouse. You got to see this crap. This honestly, I can't believe that I missed this. Um, if you've never seen this, you should look into it because it'll blow your mind. Um, uh, where is it? Oh my God. It doesn't even come up when I search it. Trans mountain crosses 30 billion threshold. This thing right here, this thing right here. Look at this. This will blow your mind. Um, so anyways, I, oh wait, no, this is, this is the pipeline. This is, no, it should be this one. Trans mountain crosses. This is the right thing, right? Anyways, um, da, 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 Friday crown corporate TMX. I think this is the right thing, isn't it? Um, Canada gas powerhouse. I was like, this is how bad it is that I can't even search it and find it. It's so buried. Um, Canada is basically building the largest, <laughs> Plant will go continue to operate. Is this the one here? Look, at this is how hard this is to find. Um, so it, honestly, it's killing me inside that I can't find the article. It's so dumb. Canada is literally building one of the largest natural gas, basically, um, refineries in the world. And they're building it right on the Vancouver coast, I think, or somewhere close to the coast so they can ship it. And obviously, Canadian Natural Resources is going to be the largest benefactor of it. Uh, and it just, uh, it, I can't find it. It's so crazy that nobody talks about it. It's so buried in the media. Uh, where the frig is it? Canada. I know it's $30 billion uh, uh, oil powerhouse. I'm just trying to search the catchphrases for it. I probably had a uh, U.S. offering Stellantis 30. Yeah, it's this thing right here. Look at this. This is what I'm looking at. This Look is at one this. of the biggest energy mega projects in North America. It's kind of wild. You've probably never heard of it. That's because it's a type of infrastructure that doesn't get as much attention as power plants or dams, despite being equally hard to build and just as crucial to the world's power supply. With the global energy crisis showing no signs of stopping, gas prices stuck at record highs and shortages made worse by Russia's invasion of Ukraine, ensuring there's enough of the stuff to go around has become a bit of a challenge. But when so you get the idea, this right? enormous new facility in Canada completes in a few years, it could provide a much needed new source of fuel that will reach far and wide, as well as providing a huge economic boost. Yeah, this thing is what's been driving Canadian natural resources to the moon and back, um, because, again, they have the largest natural gas reserve that's going to help benefit this plant massively. And it just blows my mind that the media doesn't discuss this at all. Canada is going to be, I think, the the future of just energy as it stands today. I think Canada is putting itself in the position to be, you know, Enbridge is doing the right decisions with their natural gas, uh, you know, um, their natural gas, um, you know, that acquisition they made. It, it, it makes these two companies, Enbridge and Canadian Natural Resources, the two most powerful natural gas companies on the planet. Uh, as it stands today. And I think people are largely under recognizing it as I have, because I'm an absolute moron <laughs> that hasn't really looked into it too deeply. But nonetheless, folks, we've been going on now for a good 45 minutes. Uh, it's been a pleasure to be your Sherpa through the dividend realm of return. I need to get rid of Trudeau for, <laughs> for any of that to happen. <laughs> uh, would you go uh, with Enbridge or TRP? So I just get those two in VDY. VDY holds both those. That's why I'm saying like, I would love to buy Enbridge. I would love to buy TELUS. I would love to buy the banks. There's so much shit that I would love to buy 
but why not just buy an ETF that literally holds all of them and weights the best ones at the top down? It's just, it's the more sensible thing to do because like I said, I'm a, I'm a squirrel without a nut. And if it was up to me, I'd own 30 or 40 or 50 stocks today and I wouldn't be able to manage it correctly. And it's just the way it is. So they might as well just buy, you know, one of these good ETFs that hold them. But anyways, folks, uh, take a sip for Friday night uh, live stream. This is always fun. I appreciate everyone stopping in for my sporadic streams that are Friday to Sundays whenever I'm not doing stuff. <laughs> Um, I got to do more of these. I got a lot of stuff coming up that I want to discuss on a personal level. I, I, I've been meaning to do some stuff for patron members still, but my business life has been kind of over consuming me and I'm reaching, I don't think it's a plateau in my business, but I'm reaching a level right now where I am operating with, um, with a lot of big influencers. I'm working with a lot of big platforms. I am literally discussing with the biggest players in my industry um, and I just feel like it's so weird because when I got into this, it was so new and I was so excited to just do little things. And now it's like, and I, I don't know how to talk about it because obviously like I'm trying to keep my business mostly private um, because I just don't want to get it all out there right now. Maybe one day when I, when I kind of slow down, I'll reveal everything that I've done, but um, I'm just in an interesting place and I don't know how to bring it across on this YouTube channel. Um, and I really look forward to trying to find a way to do that because I think there's a lot of value in what I've kind of done here. And I'm not trying to be like cocky or arrogant. It's just I've been working on this now since 2019. And it's just crazy how like when you start a business and how just innocent it starts to you never really know where it's going to end up. And then you're kind of at this phase where you're like, wow, I'm really doing well here. <laughs> and I'm grateful for that, especially in this tumultuous market. And I hope you guys are doing really well as well. And I just like sharing all of this to try and give you guys ideas and keep you hustling and, <clears throat> you know, living the dream as much as possible in this very tough market environment. So stay cool. Stay awesome, folks. And as always, I look forward to catching you in the next one. Peace.